and welcome to the Media Roundtable Industry Edition, where we will continue to dive deep into events and topics around the business of audio through the lens of the brands and buyers who support it, or as we like to call them, the chief audio officers. I am your host today, Dan Granger. Glad to be back with you all. We're sad to miss James Cridlin, uh, who runs Podcast Business Journal, among other publications. He's out traveling this week. Uh, but he'll be back soon, and it's okay because we have an all-star cast here with us anyway. We have uh, one of the the crowd favorites here, uh, Mr. Neil Lucy, EVP of Strategy and Insights. Welcome, Neil. It's great to be back. I'm. I feel like I'm uh, following in the footsteps of Giles, who's been on this show recent a lot recently. So it's been a few times for me that I that I haven't been on. Well, you guys are like the president and the vice president. We don't like to have you guys in the same places at the same time. We uh, we we have armed guards protecting both of your brains. So um, we're we're glad that Giles isn't here, even though, by the way, I was on a long term campaign to get Giles to even show up on the show, which he would never do. And now apparently he's doing it all the time to your detriment. But and he's hosting. Okay. Oh, he's yeah, hosting. And he's hosting. Of course. <laughs> of course. That's our Giles. Um, okay. By the way, welcome, Kyle. Nice to hear your voice. Head of uh, uh, director, senior director of client strategy, and of course, the editor in chief of the Influencer, which he's been stewarding for many years. Welcome, Kyle. Salutations. Good to be back. And then we have the great Julia Palermo, who's impressed many people with since her first debut on this show many months ago. Uh, she is media buyer and planner extraordinaire. Glad to have you with us today, Julia. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Dan. Excited to be here. I think this may be our first podcast together. Is that true? I feel like I we've done so. this, but okay. All right. Well, let's see how it goes. Let's see, you know. I will tell. How it works. <laughs> uh, I, if, if you have notes, just put them in the chat and I'll, I'll try not to get offended, but uh, love would love all the feedback I can get. All right. Welcome, everybody. Let's get down into the, the, the main stories of today. Um, Neil, You've got something to tell us about. Uh, looks like brand advertisers are having a moment in podcast. Um, why? What, what's the, what's the situation, and why is this important? All right. So the IAB released the second part of its 2023 revenue report, and uh, the the report uh, shows a significant shift to brand advertising. It's actually been kind of growing over time. So brand advertising is now representing 61% of podcast spend. The other thing that was interesting, and it's a big change, I mean, a really big change year over year, is the adoption of brand safety and suitability. I know that you're going to love that, Dan, but <laughs> it was around in 2022, those were in the 30s. And in 2023, they were both above 60% usage by publishers. So I'm not sure if that's by the, the marketplace in general, but publishers are definitely getting on board with brand suitability and safety. Um, and, you know, I think the we highlighted that Pierre Bouvard did a really good job of delving into the potential implications of what it means to have more brand advertisers coming into podcasting, something that we think is important for the performance advertisers to hear as well. Uh, he talked about broad targeting, more emotional and entertaining messaging, the brand's uh, safety and suitability, and a measurement focus that would shift more towards kind of more brand metrics versus performance metrics. I might disagree with them a little bit on the measurement because I haven't found yet a brand advertiser that doesn't want to measure short-term performance. So yes, they want to build those memory structures, but they also have to drive sales today. So I think that that's one thing that I would call out is a slight difference with Pierre that I have. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting topic on a number of different levels. I mean, there are clearly massive implications for the industry because you know the business we got into a decade ago was all performance marketers and people who want to see immediate payback right and so to see the shift in the diversification like on the pro side it's good because it provides the bigger dollars the industry needs to get the attention that it needs you know i th i remember 5 years ago some of the publishers meeting with all the big ad agencies just to get them to create a line item 
where they could start to allocate spend and recognize the channel, right? So like that's good because it's oxygen for for quality content um, and and helps the industry move forward. On the other hand, um, you know, what are the downsides of this? Well, if you're a performance marketer and everything that you're dealing with is now catering to the brands, you know, we had a publisher, one of the large ones, I'm not going to say their name here, but we didn't work for them with them for years because they just didn't care about anybody who was measuring response. Now they ended up coming around and designating resources to work with agencies and brands uh, like Oxford Road and the people we represent. Um, but it took them a while to get there. And what I hope doesn't happen is that the brand marketers uh, really start to pull the industry away from the opportunities that are gonna be needed for a campaign to actually drive performance, whether you're measuring the the performance in this quarter or you're doing a media mix model, looking at it every 90 days, whatever you're going to do at some point, you have to figure out what was the impact on my business. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's a tug of war that these things uh, that these two forces have with each other. So Neil, what else do you think about, you know, what you see as like the threats or opportunities when you see uh, the shift with brands now winning by share? Uh, I mean, there's a few things. There's a lot in this in this report. So I, we just tapped the surface of it. I mean, they talked about like 90% of the advertising is now DAI. Uh, there's a, a large shift to like 30 second units away from the more performance focused 60 plus units. Um, I, I think the IAB gives away their perspective a little bit in terms of where they see the opportunities and they talk about programmatic yeah, yeah. Uh, because of the scale and precision it offers. I'm not sure it offers scale. I don't know if it always offers precision. Uh, they talk about audience buying and oftentimes we find that we buy against audiences that doesn't actually do as well when we do more broad based buying. And then uh, they talked about video and AI. It, interestingly, which I thought was kind of eye-opening or I didn't quite believe it, I think they showed like a decrease in video podcasts year over year, which to me seems counterintuitive to what we see as, you know, that works in the marketplace. We always see that simulcasts mm -hmm. work really well. Um, so I, th I think that, they didn't mention anything about host, host endorsements and the importance of those. It was really more like it's a digital medium focus, you know, look at it from a digital perspective. And we always talk about podcasts being in a funky place of being digital, but sort of traditional at the same time or linear. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to throw out the two big concerns I have. And then I'd love for, for Julia, you to react from the position of, somebody who works with all the publishers and Kyle, I'd love for you to react as somebody that works with a number of brands of varying sizes. So the, the two issues that, that I see that are bad for everybody, brand and performance marketers uh, by moving in this direction is one, what you just mentioned, Neil, the focus of moving toward programmatic insert uh, dynamically inserted ads that, that are really, um, you know, just ad copy or uh, or like radio ads shoved into podcasts and a movement away from that authenticity that we know can drive many multiples higher response rates in an ad. And that doesn't get prioritized by big brands, frankly, I think because they're a resource drain and there's too much risk in allowing somebody to speak authentically. Uh, for a large brand and they want control and to do that at scale you want to try to minimize giving them access to that what they don't know is that if if they manage if they took the time to manage it they'd have a bitter bigger opportunity with the channel but nevertheless that's where it pulls the industry and when the industry stops caring about the things that matter to everybody um you know we have a problem that's number one number two i think it's the mirage of how uh, how well developed the tech is that they're relying on. I think that, you know, when we're talking about programmatic, when we, you know, you, I could see somebody going to a publisher, going to a big Madison Avenue ad agency, Holdco, and talking about, oh, the water's warm now. We've solved for programmatic. We've solved for brand safety and suitability. 
little do they know that these tools are still very nascent. And even as, you know, probably the leading agency in the brand safety and suitability space in audio, we're painfully aware of the human discernment that has to be applied and how these tools are used because the shorthands make it look like, oh, no, no, it's fine. We've got this covered. But when you actually go to place the buys, if you're only relying on these tools, you're going to have a massive problem that usually the people using them are under-resourced and not trained in what they would need to know to use them properly. So these are the issues I see. Kyle, from your standpoint, how, how do you look at news like this? Well, one, one thing that I think it's very important to track these things via third-party um, partners that we use, to, where I see this happening a lot is in frequency capping. I mean, listen to a podcast that's dynamically inserted and you can tell instantly these brands that go in and are just buying impressions, every single break, you'll hear the same ad over and over again. And you have to be vigilant uh, to track that and then make course corrections as needed because the networks, not maliciously, will just dump the impressions and you got to track that thing and make sure that you're not just wasting your impressions that way. Yeah, I, you, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think the network, and I, I think you said it, the networks aren't trying to do this maliciously, but they're trying to get to an impressions number, right? So the brands are buying more on an impressions basis. And in order to get those impressions, they have to run more frequency. And a lot of the audience is concentrated in the top podcast. So therefore you get this, if you don't have proper frequency capping in place, you're going to get a ton of frequency because you're just looking at the total impressions. And even if you do have the frequency capping in place, you have to double check the work because inevitably it'll slip through. We see it every single week. Yeah. Uh, Julia, any perspective from you as you're dealing with the publishers? Yeah, I, I think you guys hit the nail on the head with um, just the oversaturation uh, when it comes to this frequency capping. Um, I'm concerned as a performance marketer because it, for me, my number one thing is I want my ads to work. Um, if they're getting easy brand dollars, it could impact user experience. And then that um, could negatively impact performance for the ads I'm trying to place. Hmm. So um, I'm going to I'm going to tell a quick story um, disclosing what a dork I am. You guys know every year uh, I go with Stu, who's uh, also uh, a contributing member to this program. Um, on a historical trip somewhere in the U.S., we try to learn about it. And um, we've been when we go to a lot of the Western regions, like we were in Portland and Seattle, and you learn about the marketing campaigns that went out from these regions to try to attract settlers. And they're telling them, well, you know, there's a there's a trail you can follow, and when you get here, the the land is lush and filled with natural resources, and you can make your fortune here. And a lot of people read those communications and they show up and they go, this place is desolate. People are trying to kill us. And now my family's starving and there's also no gold as advertised. So like, it's not always when you're trying to build a, you know, when there's a boom in an industry, I think there are so many parallels um, with when you look at things like the gold rush to things like podcasts, which attracted so many people, it became so famous as a promised land, rich with resources, which it is and which there are truths behind. But if you come with fall under false pretenses, you're going to be very disappointed when you get here. And I think that it's going to snap back when word gets out, hey, there's actually a little bit of ad fraud and uh, it doesn't all perform the best that it could when you're buying it programmatically and there's no way to you know limit uh, duplication or oversaturation and things like that if you don't know what to look out for by having somebody that is a native to the space to guide you you've got a problem and i don't mean to say that in just a self-serving way there are a lot of good guides uh beyond oxford road but if you don't have one you're going to get crushed and so i think this is largely a positive headline but in the beneath that I think it's 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 there's a lot of nuance that's easy to forget when we're just looking at things that go come on out it's fine there's no danger here so that's that's kind of my last word on the topic um let's and like on. or oh, like Oregon a lot of a lot of hipsters uh, in podcasts as well so there's a lot the of hipsters is rich yeah well but you know what it's not a joke I I think that 
um, when you look at West Western culture and the West side of Western culture, it's always the tip of the sphere for people that are innovators, that love freedom, that want to find a new opportunity for something where they don't have so many rules. It's always the same story. And I do believe that what you're saying is true. That's what has made this uh, this medium special. It's not through conformity. It's not through mass production. It's from the uniqueness of pioneering voices that wanted to come here and do something that was different. And that's what we're working so hard as an organization to promote and to protect is to hold on to the good parts um, of what brought us here while we're still trying to expand it out and create opportunity for growth. It has to be a sustainable growth. And right now I feel that you know there's a lot of people that aren't paying attention to that and it concerns me. All right, here's a... Uh, Here's a new one uh, from our friend uh, Bill Gates, speaking of the Pacific Northwest. Um, apparently, about five years ago, Bill Gates's private office. Um, I know there's a, a lot of uh, room to go in other directions here, but it, his private office spun out a new uh, technology called Pix that uses AI to drive recommendations through an app. Uh, you know, show me more things. That, it's sort of like Pandora for other types of media, like uh, movies, TV shows, books, and of course, podcasts. So users can now interact with pics through text, email, voice commands, and receive curated suggestions based on what they like when they want to have something uh, that is like what they like. And so uh, what is the impact potentially for us if you just reduce it down to the audio industry? What is, what's the importance of this here that you guys see? Kyle, you got something on this? I mean, call me a skeptic. I think this has something to do with population control. I'm not certain here. Uh, but uh, I mean, frankly, it seems very interesting. Uh, but podcasts, I think, has been built by word of mouth and referrals. Like, hey, I listen to the show. You should, too. Podcast does an amazing job, too, I think, of bringing other hosts on shows that you like. And it's like, oh, this guy happens to have a podcast as well. And it kind of spreads organically. This is interesting. I don't know if anybody would use it though. I don't think I would. I don't know. What about you guys, Neil? Well, I think besides population control, <laughs> I mean, we've got to acknowledge it's that. A fair argument. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think there's value. Like, I don't know. I'm one of those people that goes on Amazon Prime, scrolling through movies, or there's 4 million podcasts, which I listen to. And by the time you kind of figure it out, you're like, uh, it's time to go to bed. So <laughs> I think there's a value in having something where you can ask. It's like, hey, I'm interested in X, Y, and Z. Can you suggest some things for me to listen to or watch, especially if you're new to podcasting and you and you like you've heard about it, you're not quite you know, have adopted it, but you have an interest and, and a recommendation engine can help you find content that would interest you. And then you can go from there. Yeah. I, you, you bring up a, a good point. I, I can't tell you how many times uh, Mrs. Granger and I have been uh, agreed that we want to watch something, but then my analytical mind wants to go through every subscription that we have and see what the most interesting things are for that day. And by the time we finish this process, a lot of times she's no longer interested in watching anything. Uh, and so I, I'm for this in all types of media. I would love to see it in podcasts. I don't believe the functionality um, is smooth yet. It would be really nice to see something like this that is uh, um, uh, native inside of the applications where you're consuming the media. But certainly there's a lot of headroom and discovery in podcasts and other things. Now, how do you actually do the human genome project type of evaluation for podcasts so that the recommendations are really going to be on point. Um, but I think this has where it has to go. And, you know, I think we've talked a lot in the past about smart speakers. And I think this is just like a feature that we're going to see that will be ubiquitous in the future where it's like, okay, you just finished an episode of something that you like, you just heard the last episode of pivot and you're like, okay, uh, Alexa, Siri, whoever, I want to hear more podcasts like this. Well, okay, great. Does that mean you're going to want to be more towards Scott Galloway or Kara Swisher? And do you want a shorter version or a longer version? Are you interested in the topic they were talking about or the way that they talk about it? 
does popularity size matter? Do political views matter? Do you want to find somebody that agrees with your views? I think that these are things that are going to happen without a doubt, but I think we're so early in the process and it's so disjointed right now that there could be a good third party to use. Most people wouldn't take the time to cross over between apps to use it. So I think he's onto something. Something tells me this is probably something he just wanted for himself. And I'd love to try it, but I don't think this is going to make a, a huge impact. I do think it will be an incremental benefit to the industry for consumption when people realize that they have to push fewer buttons to get to more things that they want. That's going to increase time spent with the medium and introduce shows that might not otherwise get a look. Until, of course, we start advertising other shows in those feeds and consumers don't really know if it's based on their organic preferences or somebody that paid for the placement. but. Time will tell. All right. Uh, next topic, uh, we, we're going to jump from um, uh, a counterpart to Bill Gates, uh, another entrepreneur uh, by the name of Suge Knight. Uh, he now uh, is he's been incarcerated for some time. I believe it's since like 2015. I could be slightly off, but it's been a minute um, that he's been behind bars. Um, he is launching a podcast or has launched a podcast. So Kyle, can you tell us about this one a little bit? Yeah, we, uh, we talked about this in last week's influencer and, uh, it's come from, uh, actually a, a media round table past uh, guest, right? Uh, Dave Mays, um, from Bre that's right. Yeah. Dave's a friend of the show. Yes. Yeah, so from breakbeat media and they're literally, uh, going to be talking to Suge from behind bars, um, which is Amazing. I'm tuning in. I want to hear what's going down. I want to know what really happened with Vanilla Ice over the uh, balcony so many years ago. But what I think this really opens up is just the opportunity to be um, innovative in the type of audio content that we're putting out or that we're able to put out through podcasts. Um, being able to have access to somebody like Suge um, <laughs> while he's in prison, is pretty interesting. And uh, I think it just kind of gets my mind thinking about like, what's next? What else can we do? Um, maybe from beyond the grave with AI, I think that's that's definitely possible. We can uh, start having, you know, Abraham Lincoln's podcast. I don't know. Uh, the Lincoln cast is uh, is definitely forthcoming. I think we're all waiting for that. But, the, you know, the difference is, uh, you know, Lincoln's probably public domain now, but for Suge, my understanding is, and look, I'm not a lawyer, um, but my understanding is you cannot profit off of your crimes. And where is the line on that? I don't know. Um, I, I did light, light, light research into the legislation behind business ventures for inmates. And what it sounds like is that in California, where he's being held, my, my vague understanding, and you should definitely check with a lawyer if this is something you need actuals on, but it sounds like you have to get special permission and cannot earn more than $50 a week on something. And so I wonder, like, what is the real opportunity here and why does he want to do it? Um, also, um, can he do endorsements or does that is that immediately illegal? But I think to some of what we were talking about earlier, I think we all think that it's probably interesting uh, to think that you can get access to somebody's perspective that never, ever, ever would have been possible in the world that we grew up in. You know, at the time that any of us learned who Suge Knight was, uh, there was no scenario in which he could be behind bars and on a media channel. So um, so I, I I think it's it's definitely like this goes in the news and uh, news and noteworthy category for me as podcasts kind of breaking down barriers and showing new rules is this something that would be safe for brands that may be a bigger question um and how much do the values that he's espousing in this show line up with their their brand values that can be uh something worth looking into as well but if nothing else it's just interesting to think that the medium continues to push the boundaries of what type of media is even available to consumers as, as far as the $50 cap per week, I do know that you can pay in cigarettes for the endorsements. So um, cigarettes per thousand is the uh, is the measurement that we use to buy this one, apparently. <laughs> cigarettes per thousand. Very good. Very I also good. think uh, we need to call out Collect Call is just an awesome name for this kind of show. I mean, couldn't, couldn't have chosen a better one. 
yeah, no, it, and I and I listened to maybe ten minutes of one of the episodes, and I think it's it's the the lead into it is very well produced. You'll hear some sounds you're familiar with, and uh, yeah, definitely good marketing. And uh, congratulations to Dave Mays for the innovation and in pulling this off. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully, uh, Suge isn't uh, exposing himself to any sort of violations of the terms of his. Uh, uh, his sentence in doing this, but uh, from our perspective, worth taking a look at if somehow that is in alignment uh, with your brand. All right, let's get to some more stories, shall we? Edison, uh, Edison has a new report that says uh, good things about streaming audio. Good things about streaming audio. Now we try to limit how many just press releases we discuss, saying hey, podcast is growing, but. Streaming can have a term. We don't we don't talk about uh, that channel that much. And let's remember, streaming is a much larger channel than podcast, uh, even though it probably gets less press. So, uh, Julia, tell us what's going on with this. Yeah, so streaming is much larger and is growing. Um, they report that now three quarters of U.S. adults have listened to streaming audio in the past month, which is a 74% increase in the past decade, which is just massive. Um, and I think this is due to a lot of things, partially new technologies like smart speakers, um, and also, you know, post COVID life, a lot of us listening at home, listening on the go. Um, and just, we're really with podcasts used to the convenience of on-demand listening, um, and to be able to on-demand listen to the radio, um, has really grown the channel. Um, and with that has grown a huge opportunity for advertisers. Um, and on the buy side, we're seeing that with the sheer amount of impressions we're able to buy. Um, and what's really cool that they pointed out was 78% of streaming listeners listen to ad supported content. Um, so there's a huge share of already a massive amount of people that are listening to the ads and the data shows that streaming listeners typically find audio ads more relevant than they do on broadcast radio. Um, because we have our different targeting layers that we're able to, uh, layer in there. Um, uh, and this kind of pairs nicely with another study about spoken word audio. Um, and we are seeing record highs with spoken word audio um, and audience size with nearly 135 million people, 13 plus uh, listening to spoken audio daily um, and mobile devices are the primary listening method. Um, so I was wondering with you guys, do you guys listen to streaming audio and what's your kind of preferred method of consumption? Well, so uh, yeah, I, I I definitely stream. I think I think we're all probably streamers here, and you know I want to give a lot of credit to Neil who refuses to skip ads even when given the opportunity. Thank you for your dedication to the the craft uh, that we're all committed to here. But um, you know, Julie, I want to dig into these numbers a little bit further here. So, if I'm getting this right, seventy eight. Oh, uh, seventy-eight percent of consumers are are now streaming, or what is the actual percentage of consumers who are streaming on a weekly basis? Uh, seventy-four percent, uh, or seventy-four percent increase. Seventy-eight percent of stream streamers are listening to ad-supported content. Got it. Okay, so we don't know the total size because I know radio still, you know, will advertise, you know, reaching ninety-five to ninety-nine percent of the the market. But I'll bet you could draw two graphs and show that the pain that terrestrial radio is feeling by revenue is uh, correlates to the benefits that streaming. And I think it's probably a more pronounced correlation than what we might see in podcast. My, my perspective is that um, they're just trading places right now. When I worked in terrestrial radio, Kyle and I both came out of terrestrial radio 10 years ago and it was interesting because streaming was getting packaged with radio ads. You would buy a, an ad on the air and then we'd do a forced combo and make you buy a streaming ad uh, in the same place because it didn't hit critical mass yet. And we were all kind of waiting for that tipping point when streaming would start to take over and it would really be radio that was going to be the drag that was going to get packaged up. Seems like we've really broken new ground in that trend and it's probably going to continue. My recollection is also that stream the streaming marketplace is probably a four to six billion dollar advertising business in the US, whereas podcast is still around two. Both of them together are still only about a third of the radio pie. So consumption is growing 
monetization hasn't quite caught up yet. It seems like there's a lot of headroom in the channel. Neil, did you have something on this one? Uh, yeah, I was going to point out a couple of things, and I think it was because there's a couple of different studies. They also talked about be, there's a ton of subscription streaming that occurs, right? So yeah. in, in the study, they had they had there was a little bit of nod to potential subscription fatigue, where people were not going to continue or subscriptions, where people where people that stream audio accept the advertising so they don't mind it as much so it maybe is not um as important to pay the subscription to skip the ads even though i i won't pay for the subscription because i need to listen to the ads uh so i thought that that was interesting and then the other thing that i thought was interesting was uh there's still a lot of ad consumption that is among the subscription population because if you're listening to a podcast for instance you're getting to ads anyway so there's even though people are subscribing to spotify they're subscribing to pandora there's still ways to reach them through advertising well and the other thing i think you bring up something that's important for for anybody that actually geeks out like we do on these numbers when you look at the audio pie in the last decade it has not grown that much for advertising we see a shift where radio bleeds streaming and that is that that waters the seeds of radio i'm sorry podcast and streaming however what it doesn't disclose is how much the subscriptions have eaten out of that pie because there's no question with pandora spotify and perhaps a few others like amazon music they're getting tremendous revenue that the ad uh, universe would kill for but I think it's actually the the aggregate growth of the channel is being held back uh, by how many people are buying their way away from some of the ads. But you're right. There is crossover. You can still reach people there. It's a great channel. One of the hard parts is measurement. And with that, I want to throw it over to Kyle. Kyle, you probably have some perspectives on this whole topic, but you know, streaming is a factor. And I know your boots on the ground working through the challenges of proving out its efficacy on a daily basis. So do you mind commenting on both the macro story and the, the challenges and solutions and measurement? Yeah, I mean, for years, we couldn't make streaming work for our performance marketers. Like people in the, how'd you hear about us post-purchase surveys, they weren't clicking streaming. I Frankly, I don't think they could distinguish between the two. It's like, well, I'm no listening chance. to radio. Um, but since Pixel, Pixels have started to take over and given us the ability to track in the last two years, we've seen phenomenal growth for performance marketers that are using pixels to be able to track um, not only the placement of the ads, making sure that they're they're going uh, where they need to be going, but also being able to track performance. And it's opened up the door for a number of things like uh, creative testing, uh, geo lift studies. Uh, it's really, really amazing. We're doing some really cool and innovative things. We'll probably see some white papers coming out here in the, in the coming weeks and months. But uh, just being able to track this, this channel through Pixels has opened up a door um, at a number of different levels. That's very, very exciting for performance marketers I'm working with, for sure. Yeah, there, there's no question. I was, on, uh, I was talking to a brand uh, of, of some size uh, earlier today who has, um, has really struggled with that channel. If you don't have a Pixel, you got a big problem. And uh, to your point, the confusion is overwhelming when you start to survey people. We, you know, surveys, we've been big um, advocates for just asking people how you heard about us. And normally that is if you if you have the right instrumentation, you can get really precise numbers on things like radio and podcast. But when you get into streaming, it's a mess. People don't even know what there is. It, are they listening to Pandora? Are they listening? They think they're listening to radio, perhaps. So it gets very, very confusing. And in the pixel Geddon situation we're all facing, I think it's going to continue to be challenged. Um, and your media mix model isn't going to be much help here either. So it's it's dangerous terrain from a measurement standpoint. But I think, you know, we just to underscore what you're saying, we have had a bit of an epiphany in the last few years at how powerful it actually is for performance if you can create the right instrumentation. Uh, to measure that. Well, I think that brings us to our 
our final, uh, one of our final stories. We're going to wrap up in about 10 minutes here. Um, if your brand uh, is, is, you always have to take risks. And sometimes brands may be playing it too safe. Um, Neil, sounds like there's some some new research on this. Do you mind sharing a little bit? Uh, sure. This uh, research comes from Odyssey. So they may have, you know, some interest in, <laughs> in the outcome of the research. So take that with a grain of salt. But uh, it was about uh, the it was a study on brand safety and suitability in podcasts. And some of the common, I think, assumptions that marketers make were challenged. In particular, like true crime, uh, controversial podcast topics, you know, are are viewed positive positively by listeners. I mean, true crime is a top five genre, so the popularity of true crime can't be denied. But advertisers can be cautious about those environments. So while the consumers are listening, average tires say, oh, it's true crime. I don't want to have my message associated with that content. Where the consumers are viewing or listening to that more from the mindset of they want to learn something. They, you know, there's there's an interest in finding out more about like what happened, how it happened, versus, you know, that it was you know, that it's a crime related podcast. So I think, um, it, you know, it, it, it underscores that sometimes as marketers, we can sometimes forget the consumer or we put ourselves as the consumer and we're not the consumer. So it, it I think there's, there's value in the study. And I think it, we have to remind ourselves that consumers may listen to content differently than we do. And if they're listening to it, they're listening to it for a reason. And it's a place that we can advertise. This is such an important topic. And I'm going to just repeat a point that I think needs to be made over and over for about a decade by a lot of us in this industry so that it sinks in. The big problem with brand safety and suitability is that it's motivated by fear and the ways that most people react to it is through exclusion and knee-jerk reactions that are more reactive than they are strategic. We have to decide if we want to live in a world that is governed by having a set of topics that are unmentionable simply because of the topic, or whether we judge a show by the treatment of its topics. I am a staunch believer in the latter. I think we have a pretty good consensus around that at the agency, that if you have, what happens when we live in a world where you can't use words like Trump, Biden, COVID, Israel, Palestine, abortion? Do we want to live in a world where these things are unmentionable because sponsors won't support content that mentions it? Or can we find ways to measure the way those topics are treated to say, are they treated with responsibility or irresponsibility and help advertisers line up with important topics treated properly, sensitively. And this is the, the fundamental mistake that I think probably the whole brand safety and suitability industry struggles with even well beyond audio, but we're seeing it here and we're calling it here. And it's a very, very important distinction. And I think this article very well underscores that problem that we react to the label and we don't really care about whether the label is a nutrient or uh, a pesticide. Like we don't really distinguish between those things, but it does matter. It does matter. Uh, so uh, any, do you guys have anything to share on this one? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you're right. I think it's the, it's the sensitive social issues and how we're approaching that that is really the most concerning and, and what we need to be vigilant and, and informing and helping our advertisers kind of navigate through. This one, I think they were focusing too much on true crime. I haven't had an issue with true crime or an advertiser mentioned true crime since my favorite murder came out. Early on, maybe people were like, I don't wanna be associated with it. I haven't heard that in three, four years, I think. But our talking culture's about... been a little bit desensitized. In exactly. <laughs> yeah, We've been crime... sensitized in some ways and desensitized in other ways, right? Exactly. But like how we're approaching and how we 
you know, help our, our advertisers, you know, navigate through brand safety on these central sensitive social subjects. That's really where we can, we can lean in and, and help navigate through that. Yeah. Anything, uh, did you guys want to chime in on this one? Um, I would add that Kyle, I think you work with marketers that maybe are a little bit more open to <laughs> going into different genres and the hosts that they associate with. There are definitely advertisers out there that are still very cautious. I was on a phone call last week and I mean, there is caution out there. And I think people, aver advertisers and marketers are trying to avoid any kind of controversy, um, whether, whether real or not. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. they don't exist. But if if you have anybody kicking back on true crime, just give them, give me a call. We'll uh, I'll talk. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk them off the ledge. <laughs> well, and there's pro there are probably brands that that do want to avoid true crime uh, based on the the content. And you know, when you're being glib about things like murder, saying which ones are your favorites. Um, you know, that that could be it, it is interesting to see what things we've developed, like really thick skin about and which things are absolutely unable to be discussed. Uh, but, yeah, true crime is usually not one of the ones that comes up because it's so popular and fills all of the. But look, it's freaking soap operas, right? It's the it's the it's the evening news it, for whatever reason at least in our culture, we're very attracted to hearing about the way that people died. That's big business. And uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, it's become, for better or for worse, normalized to the point that it's it's not even one of the issues that brands are most concerned about. So if it's popping up here, you can extrapolate that more important issues that are relevant to our futures are off the table uh, well before people even take something like this off the table. All right, so we're running out of time, but Julie, I want you to bring us home. Um, uh, what types of podcast listeners are which types of consumers? Can you break that one down for us? Yeah, so there was a cool study post, uh, reported by Signal Hill Insights and Triton Digital that examines the connection between podcast listeners and their or podcast listeners' preferences and their listening habits. So I thought this one was really cool because one of my favorite things about advertising is understanding the consumer. Um, and so they broke it down into four types of listeners. So there's heavy listeners, new podcast listeners, sports listeners, and music podcast listeners. I think as you know, time develops, we can get a little more granular with this, but they identified heavy listeners tend to enjoy fast food and frequent the gym. New podcast listeners are seen as potential customers for direct-to-consumer brands and online retailers. Sports listeners more likely to fly for business and buy a new vehicle and music podcast listeners more likely to purchase home and auto insurance and switch to cell phone providers. Um, so this is cool because it's going to help us tailor for our brands um, where the consumer lies. Um, they surveyed 12,000 people. So there was a pretty significant group. Um, and it's really going to help us improve our psychographic targeting and messaging for brands. Um, so as a planner, this is just exciting to kind of start moving in this direction to help us understand the audience more and more so that we can be more precise with our recommendations and throughout the planning process. I think the part I'm most surprised about there is that uh, the people who like fast food also like the gym. Seems like a bit of a, <laughs> a, they could, they could skip both potentially and be in better shape, but um, no, it's, it's good. And it, I guess the question is if I'm listening to this episode and we're talking about this type of research and I go, Oh, I, I'd really like to see more than just a one paragraph description of a podcast before I sponsor it. Uh, how do I get this type of data? What do you have to subscribe to to be able to access this sort of thing? And I'll flip it to you, Neil, uh, to share that and any other thoughts you have on the subject. Uh, the I think the other thought I have on the subject is this reminds me of a study that was done last year by Pew Research uh, that was really good, which talked about informational versus entertainment content and podcasts and how different segments will gravitate towards informational versus entertainment. So, you know, tend to be kind of the 45 and up or much more into uh, informational where the, the younger side of the equation is much more into entertainment or a balance of entertainment information. So it reminded me of that. So I, I think that, I think this is a, 
a good piece to just have more understanding of how consumers listen to podcasts and that people, different segments can listen to podcasts in different ways. And we can take that into consideration in our campaigns and our targeting strategies to reach consumers. Amen. Wonderful closing thoughts. And uh, I think this has been a really good show. I think we got into some meaty topics. So hope it's applicable. Um, if, if you're listening, um, do send us feedback. We do like feedback. Info at MediaRoundTable.com. Let us know if you're getting something out of it and how we can make it even better. Uh, Julia, how did we do? How was the chemistry today with us both on the podcast? I think we did pretty good. We got to run it back again sometime. I feel like it was solid. Let's Let's repeat, shall we? Okay. Uh, thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Julia. This podcast is brought to you by Oxford Road, as always, where we want you to succeed in audio and use your influence for good. As members of the marketing community, we have the power to advance voices that don't just entertain, but also edify, to build bridges across differences and preserve fair-minded discussion around the most important topics of our age. We have to keep repeating this. If you're a marketer and you're looking to align your brand values with extraordinary business outcomes, reach out to our agency, Oxford Road, by visiting OxfordRoad.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our weekly influ newsletter, The Influencer, which is edited by the one and only editor-in-chief, Kyle Jelinek. And thank you to everybody who helped behind the scenes, Bianca, Haley, Everett, and the team at Podcast One. And as always, influence responsibly. 